Here's a bottle of champagne. Bear with me, because this really is about phonetics. And here's a bottle of champagne upside down. And here's a silly question. How come the champagne doesn't pour out of the bottle when I turn it upside down? You don't need to be an expert in champagne or phonetics to know that the champagne doesn't come out of the bottle because the bottle's got a cork in it that stops the liquid from escaping from the bottle. Here's another bottle of champagne. And here's another silly question. Why is the champagne now escaping from the bottle? The obvious answer is that somebody popped the cork. But what we're really interested in is the explanation for why the champagne is escaping. So the reason that champagne is a sparkling wine is because it contains dissolved carbon dioxide. And this produces the bubbles, but it also produces an internal pressure that is always pushing upwards on the cork. When we loosen a cork in a champagne bottle, that pressure becomes sufficient to make the cork pop off. And if we aren't really careful, in fact, we get an initial burst of champagne out of the bottle, and then the champagne begins to flow more smoothly as it escapes. Cheers. Okay, you ask, so what about phonetics? What does all this stuff about champagne bottles have to do with how we make consonant sounds? Consonant sounds like the sound B shown here. Actually, our champagne example is pretty useful as a mechanism for introducing us to the concept of manner of articulation. In our last video, we learned about the concept of place of articulation. And by place, we mean where in the vocal tract a consonant constriction is made. But knowing where a sound is made is clearly not the same thing as knowing how a sound is made. And manner of articulation is all about the how. In the rest of this video, we're going to focus on three different manners of articulation and consonant sounds. In particular, we're going to look at stop consonants, fricative consonants, and affricate consonants. So let's get started with stops. What exactly do we mean when we say that a sound is a stop? Well, let's revisit our little bottle of champagne. We know that even if we pour the bottle upside down, champagne can't pour out. That's because there's a cork completely blocking the bottle opening. What's most important for our purposes here is that the cork blocks the opening of the bottle and completely prevents the flow of champagne from the bottle out into the world. And even though humans aren't bottles of champagne, it is worth noting something important about the way we produce speech. When we produce speech, we push air up from our lungs. That airflow passes through the larynx, where the vocal cords are. And finally, it exits through the mouth and sometimes through the nose. OK. Now let's revisit the sagittal section images that we saw in our presentation on place of articulation. This is clearly an image of a bilabial sound, which we can see because the two lips are pressed together. But what's most important for our purposes here is that that bilabial constriction completely blocks the flow of air coming up from the lungs. Any sound that completely obstructs the airflow that's coming up from the lungs is called a stop. And to convince you that we might be a little bit more like champagne bottles than we think, another important property of stops is that because they're blocking airflow that's coming up from the lungs, they're similar to the cork in our champagne bottle. Stops are also similar to our champagne bottle because just like the liquid in the bottle builds up pressure behind the cork, the airflow coming up from the lungs builds up pressure 
behind the stop constriction. In this particular case, behind the lips. This also means that when we release a stop, in this case, for example, opening the lips into a following vowel for something like ba, we're also going to release the air that's built up pressure behind our lips. That release is going to cause a burst of air to come out of our mouth, much like the pressure that builds up behind a cork and causes it to pop when we loosen it. In English, we make stops at three places of articulation. P and B are the bilabial stops. T and D are the alveolar stops. And K and G are the velar stops. Now that we have a handle on what stops are, it's time to look at fricatives. Let's start with another picture. I'm going to guess that all of us have done this at one time or another, probably to spray somebody else. This hose can help us understand what's going on when we make fricatives. By partially blocking the end of the hose, we take the smooth flowing water and we make it flow turbulently. Unlike stop consonants, which we make by blocking the flow of air momentarily, but completely, with fricatives, we make a constriction in the vocal tract, but it's a constriction that forces the air through a narrow opening, much like what we just saw with the thumb over a hose. So when we make fricatives, we make sounds that force air through a narrow opening. Because of this, the smooth or laminal flow of air that's coming up from our lungs becomes turbulent. The same principle can be seen here in the illustration showing water, which is flowing fairly smoothly until it reaches a narrowing in its path, at which point it becomes turbulent. Okay. So English has nine fricative consonants. Eight of these are supralaryngeal consonants. And the ninth is the glottal fricative H that we discussed in our presentation on place of articulation. Here's a useful screen that illustrates the nine fricative consonants of English distributed across five places of articulation. First, we see the labiodental fricatives F and V. Then we have the dentals or interdentals, theta and eth. The alveolar fricatives of English are S and Z. And the palatoalveolars or postalveolars are sh and j. And finally, the glottal fricative, as we've said, is H as in hard or ahead. You might be happy to hear that there's only one more manner of articulation that we need to cover in this presentation. The third manner of articulation that we're going to cover here is for sounds that we call affricates. And if you understand stops and you understand fricatives, guess what? You understand affricates because an affricate sound is essentially a consonant that starts out as if it's going to be a stop and then finishes as if it were a fricative. English only has two affricate consonants, and they're both palatoalveolar sounds. The illustration here also provides the international phonetic alphabet symbols for each. The two affricates in English are ch, as in choose, and j, as in jet. OK, we're almost done. There's just one more term that I'd like to make sure we know. And that's the term obstruent. The term obstruent is pretty easy to remember if you keep in mind the word obstruct or obstruction. And in linguistics, we use the term obstruent to group together the most obstructed consonants. That is, we use the term obstruent to group together stops, fricatives, and affricates. Okay, well, that's it for now, but we'll be back for more manner terms in our next installment of Adventures in Articulatory Phonetics.